talking about today, the topic will be the gender and immunization. If you are, <clears throat> we would like to welcome all the scholars taking the course actually, but also all the guests who are here for the first time, you warm welcome. And uh, this webinar today will be talking about gender immunization. We know that the topic is important and uh, I will just want you to uh, use the chat box and the Q&A during the session to really make the interaction with the panelists, the subject matter experts from WHO. I won't say that much about them. I will let them introduce themselves. But today I will really ask you to interact with the Q&A box. Ask as much as question as you can because they are here today to respond to your question and we really want to you to bring out your experience. So I will stop talking here, um, turn myself to Geneva and uh, uh, welcome me warmly, uh, Jimil Bal from uh, WHO HQ, who first present herself and take us through the webinar. Warm welcome to all of you. Nice to have you all. Jimil, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and greetings from Geneva. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are so happy to have you uh, come in huge numbers for this webinar on an important topic relating to gender mainstreaming in, in health and in particular immunization. I know that it will be a webinar where all of us will learn a lot uh, because it is currently um, for us uh, a new area of work, a new area of focus, and we have the best experts um, that have been working in this area within WHO and more broadly in health. And I, I am so happy to introduce my two colleagues, uh, Shireen Hydri and um, Michaela Mana uh, for this webinar today. And without uh, taking more, more of your time, I would ask them to um, directly introduce themselves and then take us through this wonderful presentation that they have prepared today. And as Alan said, Please feel free to put in your questions. There will be opportunities within the webinar and after uh, the presentation to, uh, to have uh, this interaction with the experts. Thank you very much. And I hope this session is uh, useful for, to you all. Over to Shireen and uh, Michaela. Great, thank you so very much for, for the introduction, Jill Neal. Uh, my name is Shirin Heydari. I'm a senior technical consultant to WHO, working with the Gender Equity and Human Rights team. And I have the pleasure to uh, co-facilitate and present this session with my colleague, Michaela. Michaela, over to you to present yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Michaela Manna. Uh, I work at WHO as gender specialist for the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Um, I'm really happy to uh, co-present this uh, presentation and this uh, session on uh, gender health and immunization uh, with uh, Shireen. I see you come from all over the world. This is really exciting. So I'm really looking forward to having this uh, discussion with you. Thank you and over to you, Shireen. Thank you so much. So the session is on gender mainstreaming in health with the focus on immunization. The objectives is to understand how gender-based differences and inequalities can impact the health of women and men, and also to show how to apply a gender lens in immunization planning and program. Uh, we only have one and a half hour for this session and uh, the issues are really broad and complex so we will not have sufficient time to cover everything or go into the depth of many of these issues but this is more really like a teaser to make you uh, curious more interested in the topic and give you some guidance on where you can find more resources and read more in order to apply a gender lens in your uh, programs in order to improve results. We are trying to make this session very interactive. Uh, so we are hoping to also make sure that you can ask your questions, but also share some of your experiences uh, with us. We have structured this session into three main sections. Uh, one, to talk about uh, the more broader concepts of sex and gender and how they affect our health. Uh, thereafter, we're talking about gender and immunization. And finally, how can we do gender analysis 
and uh, uh, unidentified gender-based barriers. Uh, as mentioned, we would try to uh, allow plenty of time for you to ask your questions and share your experiences. We also introduce five minutes Q&A between each section for you to ask any questions related to that specific section. Please feel free during the presentations to share your questions in the chat box and during the Q&A section, we will also make sure that uh, you can raise your virtual hands and then speak and ask your questions. So let us start with what is sex and what is gender. These terms are often used and treated as if they were the same and used interchangeably, but often incorrectly. So it's really important for us to understand the concept of sex and gender and how we can distinguish them. We often talk about sex when we are referring to biological uh, differences and biological characteristics that are a result of our chromosomal compositions. These result in differential uh, differences at the molecular level, cell, cellular level, immunological level, physiological level, anatomical level, resulting in the difference anatomy of sexual and reproductive anatomy, as well as in differences with related to uh, presentation of disease, susceptibility to diseases, as well as the uh, treatment response and health outcomes. Gender, on the other hand, is a socially constructed norms, roles, behaviors, relationships, responsibilities, values, attitudes, and forms of power that a given society assigns to women and men. It is not a binary, it is a spectrum uh, of femininity to masculinity and it affects a lot of our opportunities in life. It affects our uh, choices we are offered and made with respect to uh, education, to employment, to hobbies. Uh, it's uh, expected how we are behaving, how we are talking, how we are walking, how we are uh, interacting with each other. Uh, and we are socialized from an early age into what are expected of us as men and women and boys and girls. And that's, uh, as we simply say, we are born with a sex and socialized into a gender. However, while gender norms and roles are uh, quite deep rooted, they're also dynamic and subject to change and can change over time as well as in different settings. Uh, for example, these advertisements are not from that long ago, but these days uh, almost across any places in the world, these are cons considered quite shocking. And these gender norms and roles are constantly challenged, as these two examples shows. For example, these advertisements are trying to challenge the gendered labor segregation. The picture on the left is saying that it's a woman's war too, as a way to attract women to a domain that has been predominantly male, the military. Uh, and the picture on the right, are you man enough to be a nurse, is trying to also attract men into a field that has been considered quite feminine. But as you can also see that uh, these pictures, these advertisements, while they're trying to challenge the gendered labor segregation, at the same time, they're reinforcing the notion of masculinity being different and perhaps even superior to femininity. As you can say, the men are equipped with some masculine tools and equipments in order to reinforce their manhood and masculine identity, as if being a nurse would be emasculating, whereas in the picture to the left with the woman, the woman is dressed in a suit and a tie, as in order to show that women can actually match up to men. She's also placed behind a switchboard. These are examples that show that, you know, again, while there are changes uh, and gender norms can be very dynamic and change, at the same time, they can also be very deep-rooted gender structures that are more difficult to change and challenge. When it comes to health, there is a very complex interaction between sex and gender. Our biological sex can influence our susceptibility to disease, uh, to presentation of symptoms, how we are reacting to different drugs and the drug metabolism, our immunological response to vaccines and pathogens, whereas our uh, gender can cause uh, vulnerability to diseases, what we are exposed in terms of risks, what we are 
taking, forth kind of risk taking behavior we have, how we are uh, accessing uh, information about health services, how are we accessing and af having af uh, or affording health services, but also uh, how we are treated in a healthcare system. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is probably a very, very good example of uh, this complex interaction between sex and gender. In the COVID, we know uh, with data so far that men are at greater risk of severe disease and death due to biological reasons. There have been uh, studies that show that the men might not have as a strong immune response to the infection as, as uh, women do. Women have shown to have a stronger T cell response and a higher level on of uh, anti-spike IgG, for example, uh, but also men have more pre-existing conditions such as cardiovascular diseases, which is also a risk factor for death. But there are also social risk factors associated with that. For example, there, there, there is a higher prevalence of smoking among men, which is also a risk factor. Women's vulnerability to infection of, uh, with coronavirus is very much gendered as well. Women are often in caregiving roles, either at home caring for children or sick family members, or in the formal health sector. Uh, women make up 70% uh, of the healthcare workforce and the majority of the frontline healthcare workers managing COVID-19 patients. So as such, they are more frequently exposed to a larger amount of virus and at greater risk of infection. There were also some early indications that the personal um, uh, protective equipments were not fitting women well as they were mostly designed with male anatomy in mind. And there may also have been access issues related to access to uh, PPEs while the supply was limited. Uh, there is very little data from the health workforce, but the data that are out there, for example, from Italy show that among healthcare workers infected with COVID, nearly 70% uh, of them were actually women. The gendered implications of COVID goes beyond the risk of infection and death. Uh, as you might have uh, seen reports of increased risk of violence against women, children and people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity during lockdowns. There are limited access to essential services, including and most particularly sexual and reproductive health services as resources are reallocated to address the pandemic. Um, we have all kind of witnessed the disproportionate burden of domestic and child care and care responsibilities on women, which has also resulted in both mental health issues, but also issues related to income loss. Women are also more likely to work in the informal economy or work in part-time job, and as such at a greater risk of either losing their jobs where service sector is closing down, or at um, not having a social safety net if they are in an informal sector. Uh, I won't go into more details around that, but the WHO has issued the gender and COVID advocacy brief that you can access on the website. And there are lots of other very useful resources uh, on gender and COVID, including on the website of the gender and COVID-19 working group. If you Google that, you'll find, you find that uh, website. But perhaps the combination of sex and gender in fueling a pandemic was most evident in the HIV field. HIV exposed the endemic gender-related inequalities, biases, and injustices that still today is responsible for our ineffectiveness to end that epidemic. For example, young girls are twice as likely to be HIV positive than young boys. Transgender women and men who have sex with men are also at much greater risk of infection. And while these risks of infection, the higher risk among both women as well as transgender and men who have sex with men are partly due to biological reasons, they're also very much influenced by socioeconomic, behavioral, and structural factors. Among women, for example, lower school attendance, lower literacy, gender-based violence, FGM, early marriages, economic dependency and poverty, stigma and discrimination, barriers to access services, including and most importantly, sexual and reproductive health services, all uh, influence and make women more vulnerable to HIV infection. 
The same goes true with people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity, which are highly stigmatized and marginalized in the society, and other intersectional factors, which, uh, which means uh, people of ethnic minorities, people living with disability, people who engage in sex work or use drugs. Those are all uh, create compounded disadvantages for these people. And that actually, many of these factors early on in the epidemic revealed that many of the prevention strategy that was early on used for the HIV field, for example, abstinence, using condom and monogamy within relationships ended to be very ineffective and outside the control of women. And that's how research and development initiated to look at the, for the need for a women control prevention methods. And these are the issues that can come up through uh, applying a gender lens to a health condition. But it's important to know that gender is not only about women's concerns, although boys and men as a group tend to hold privilege and power based on their gender. They also demonstrate disproportionate rates of mental and physical health problems, public health concerns, and they also have a lower life expectancy. For example, men have higher rates of uh, completed suicide, are more often involved in acts of violence, in substance abuse, incarceration, and again, overall uh, early mortality. And socialization of men and boys to conform to traditional masculine norms often limits their uh, psychological development. They can constrain their behavior, disengage them from childcare or parental responsibility, and negatively influence their mental and physical health. Masculine ideas, uh, expectations of dominance and aggression may heighten the potentials for boys to engage in acts of violence, including but not limited to bullying, assault, physical or verbal aggression, not only against women and girls, but also against other men. Men are overrepresented both as perpetrators, but also victims of homicides. But it's not only individual and social factors, the notion of gender are embedded in political, economic, social, cultural systems where norms are shaped and reinforced and where these very much influence how power and resources are distributed. Institutional gender influences the way information are formed and disseminated, how the education system, the political system, the health system are designed and operated, and of course clearly influence how programs, including especially health programs, are planned, funded, implemented, and utilized. In the health sector, gender influences priority given to women, men's, or gender non-conforming people's health services, decisions about which services should be offered, and this is particularly true with, with regard to sexual and reproductive health services, resource allocation, quality of care and provider attitude, gender biases, sexism, racism, disrespect and abusing care, including towards indigenous and ethnical minorities, refugees and migrants, all of those result in differential health outcomes. And of course, participation in decision making about, about all of that above. Important to note that the experiences of all women and men are not the same. Gender intersects with other dimensions of inequality to result in compounded disadvantages. Intersectionality identifies how power relationships interact with gender and other drivers and inequity to produce differences in health experience and outcome. For example, the challenges that the woman of an ethnic minority living with a disability is facing in accessing healthcare and services are likely very different and multifold than a woman from an ethnic majority living without disability. But the experience of that woman is also likely very different from a man in the exact same position. So it's really important to think about all those intersectional identities. So to ensure that gender dimensions are adequately and meaningfully considered in our policies and programs, we need to mainstream gender and ideally other intersecting factors as well. Gender mainstreaming is the process of assessing the implications for women and men, boys and girls of any planned action in all areas and at all levels. 
it is a strategy for making women's as well as men's concerns, experiences, and integral dimension in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of policies and programs in all political, economical, and social spheres, including and particularly in the health sectors and in the health programs. So uh, to kind of get you warm up a little bit, we thought that we we're going to start with a quiz to test about uh, what you know and what is your experience of gender. So Ella will start the quiz now. You have about one to two minutes to answer the questions, and then we together we'll look at the answers and see how we are doing. Thank you so much, Yuvin. That was very captivating. So please go ahead, look on your screen, and you will see uh, a small window that is there with seven questions. So you have to use your finger or your, if you share light up, click on your, the answer. Is the true and false answer. So please go ahead and uh, start um, voting. We will have maybe a minute and a half because of the fact that there are seven questions, please feel free to really respond to the questions because it's really important for the rest of the presentation. And I know that Shirin and Michela would really love you, your participation through the, the poll. So please go ahead and look at your screen. And uh, I can see that 15 of you already find their way out. And thank you. So we have... Uh, Seventeen are ready to vote. Thank you, and uh, we still have one more minute. So please go ahead and just look at your screen, and your answers are uh, valued. Well done, everyone. So nearly fifty percent of attendees already. Uh, use the poll Seems like we have a very knowledgeable crowd. Yes, we are nearly 70% of the room are already done. Very well done, well done. And uh, um, 30 more seconds for those who are still uh, having a uh, talk around the questions. And we know your time is precious. So uh, we, will, we will now uh, stop the pool. We have likely 80% of the attendees who participated on the on the pool. So we are stopping now because we have more to discover from Sherina and Michaela. So we will end the poll now and uh, turn back to uh, Sherin and Michaela for your comment. Sherin, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. And Michaela, please join me as well. I thought we can take a moment just to go through <laughs> these questions kind of give the right answer. I think the crowd has done a great job. Uh, uh, Risk-taking behavior is influenced by social expectations of masculinity and femininity. Studies show that uh, boys already at young age are encouraged to take more risk, whereas girls are kind of encouraged not to take risk and be more careful. So that is very much true. Uh, again, correct the second one as well. Eating disorder does not only affect girls, it affects both girls and boys, but because of the gender social expectations, boys are often going underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Um, there is a higher biological risk for women to contract HIV during unprotected vaginal intercourse because of the larger vaginal mucosa and because women are also exposed to a larger volume of virus uh, that is in the semen. So the, 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 that is a true answer. The, the answer is true. Um, women and men and transgender persons, of, regardless of their sexual orientations, are often not treated the same way in the healthcare. Unfortunately, there are 
a number of studies showing a higher level of stigma, discrimination, disrespect, and abuse against people of sexual di diversity and gender, uh, different diverse gender uh, identity and sexual orientation. There are also a number of studies showing disrespect and abuse against women, in particular in child care. So that is uh, uh, unfortunately a common uh, problem. Uh, Michaela, I'll take the first five and you can take the first, the last five if you want. That's okay? Yes, yes, sure. Thank you, Shireen. Uh, well, it seems again that uh, um, you are very clear that uh, um, there are gender-related barriers to, um, to immunization and that the level of education of the mother uh, does actually affect uh, a child immunization status. Uh, and, and as well that, um, of course, gender-related barriers uh, do not only affect girls. So um, the majority of people have this very clear and uh, we will go through this uh, in, uh, in a while. I, I just want to also ask, um, highlight question number five, which was actually interesting because there's a 50 50. Uh, yeah. Symptoms for heart attack are actually different in women and men. And that has been a big problem because the, the, the symptoms of heart attack has been mainly based on studies in men. So a lot of women have actually gone underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed because they have shown a different symptoms. And that's a very interesting topic if you want to look it up. Thank you so much for participating. You've done an amazing job. Uh, so I will hand over then to Michaela to take you forward on to your specific topic on immunization. Michaela, I unshare my screen so you can share yours. Yes, thank you, Shireen. Let me share my screen. Okay, hope you can all see. Let me, it's taking a while to do the full screen yes, presentation. Yes, Michaela, we can see your screen. So Great. we just encourage the participant to really ask the question related to uh, sharing presentation now on the q and She will be really pleased to, uh, to answer your question. Go, over to you, Michaela. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Alan. So, um, let, let's uh, look into uh, more details. Uh, what are gender-related barriers to immunization? And I, uh, I already seen that some of you already um, talked about the gender-related barriers uh, um, that you have encountered. Uh, if you would like to share uh, more uh, experience, uh, we would really welcome to, um, sorry, if you, um, if you want to do so in the chat and, uh, and, uh, and share your experience about that. Maybe let's give just some time for people to, uh, if you want to write. We can, yes, of course. Feel free to use the chat box right now to respond to the question on the screen. If you have the experience as said here, please go ahead and type it on the chat box. Thank you. We can, of course, then uh, go back and uh, and uh, discuss also in the Q and A uh, uh, session that uh, that we will have. Um, maybe let's start looking at those uh, at those barriers. Um, so uh, we know that at the global level. Um, there is no significant difference in immunization coverage for boys and girls. Um, but, there is a but, uh, we also know uh, that there are notable variations within countries and regions. So sometimes we see uh, higher coverage for girls in some places where in other places we see higher uh, coverage uh, for boys. Um, and so we know that there are in fact a multiplicity of gender linked factors that affect a girl, uh, that a child's immunization status from uh, uh, some preference, for instance, uh, uh, maternal education. Uh, and so all these uh, uh, gender dimensions uh, vary between, uh, of, between the countries and between different uh, contexts. Um, here we have summarized uh, uh, some uh, of uh, some of those barriers. So, uh, for instance, the fact that mothers are typically the primary care caregivers, and I and I saw before in the chat someone was pointing this out. So, uh, but as because they have a lower status in the household, they uh, maybe they're not able to decide for their own. Um, 
of course, they are affected by uh, physical and time barriers. So sometimes it's difficult for them to access immunization services. Uh, sometimes they lack literacy, health literacy in particular. So uh, understanding the importance of immunization, it's maybe more challenging. And, uh, um, and sometimes there is also a problem relating to the quality of service that they, um, they, they, uh, um, uh, they are confronted to. So um, it's very important to remind, as, as you uh, know very well, that in, in the moment that the, uh, uh, the in the immunization process, uh, there are uh, not only, the, of course, the children involved, but the, but the caregivers, the parents, and uh, uh, the health workers, so the health staff in, in charge of the immunization. And we have to uh, keep this in mind because it's really important. And uh, if we look uh, in more detail into uh, into those barriers, uh, we can um, we can uh, maybe um, divide them uh, um, in uh, in demand side barriers, uh, where um, as we as we saw, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, in some settings, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, some preference. So, so maybe uh, boys are prioritized over girls or uh, there are physical barriers. So uh, women are not allowed to go to, to, the, to the health center alone and maybe they need permission. Uh, they can experience stigmatization uh, receiving a particular type of vaccine. Uh, and, um, and even if they're considered the primary caregivers, uh, maybe they're not the, the sole uh, decision makers. Um, we also know, for instance, uh, that uh, sometimes it's a, it's a trade-off for, for, for a mother to decide whether to go to the health center or to work. And also this is a difficult uh, uh, situation that sometimes they face. And as we said that maybe um, the lower education and literacy level uh, can hinder access to, to, to services. So it was really interesting to uh, read some of your experiences uh, that you, uh, you took the time to um, uh, to report uh, uh, during the application process. And here we can see an example of uh, uh, demand side barriers. Uh, this is an example from uh, South Sudan. Um, saying that uh, uh, in, the, in the year 2013 and 15, uh, there was a, a, a the, there was a, a, a low participation of men in immunization and uh, activities. And so some men was, uh, were also discouraging their women from taking uh, children to the vaccination. So uh, um, we can read that some activities were uh, organized and, uh, um, and the perception change. And uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to see that from a, a coverage of less than 50%, uh, uh, it was reach, uh, the coverage reached nearly 90%. Here as well, um, this example, it's from Indonesia, uh, where um, um, this woman say that uh, women are acutely affected by physical and time barriers to access immunization services. So here again, something that we, uh, that we saw before. Um, we know there are also supply side uh, uh, barriers. Uh, so, uh, for instance, the fact that the government uh, do not really pay a lot of attention in, a gender, uh, in, in, in gender policies, so maybe they, they just target women, or uh, the community uh, um, have a lot of control into, into women's and girls' uh, uh, full participation in health services. Uh, the fact that maybe health facilities emphasize attendance uh, by women, so they're not favorable if the, the men are attending the facility, or um, as we said, in some setting, uh, maybe all male vaccinators are not allowed to enter into homes, uh, or the fact that providers also themselves, they face discrimination uh, as a, a female health worker. And also sometimes the fact that the, there is the low quality of service uh, uh, may discourage a, a woman to attend. And here again, 
uh, some example from from you from your experience uh, uh, this one is from Kenya say that uh, when the HPV vaccine was uh, introduced uh, there was a lot of resistance because there was an assumption that the vaccine is uh, was a form of contraceptive and it was only given to girls and so this uh, uh, um, created a lot of opposition especially uh, from uh, from the community and it's interesting to notice uh, that the most vocal voices were made who uh, influenced uh, the people against the, the vaccine. And here as well we have an example from uh, uh, from Libya and say that for instance uh, strangers are not allowed to uh, visit home um, and also this uh, uh, mm, mm, affected the, the, the campaign so they then piloted female vaccinator uh, visit. So um, here, I just would like to um, take a few moments to uh, introduce you to the to uh, the gender equality strategy that the Global Polio Eradication Initiative launched and, and approved in May 2019. Uh, because we really realize that if we want to uh, reach every last child, we really have to apply a gender lens in uh, in our programming. So uh, the strategy. Um, aims to effectively integrate the gender considerations in, into uh, the GPI uh, intervention. And uh, we developed uh, uh, four gender sensitive indicators. Uh, mm, so uh, to monitor the participation in vaccination campaigns of children, uh, so the percentage of female and male who participated in vaccination campaigns, the total doses that the children received, uh, the timeliness of disease surveillance, so to monitor whether uh, uh, boys and girls are taken to the health service with the same, uh, within the same time frame, and then also the representation in uh, immunization activities of uh, female health workers. Um, again, here, um, I just, we would like to show you um, an example of monitoring of sex disaggregated data. We will have we will have a time uh, a bit later to go into a bit more detail of sex disaggregated data. But um, we receive a, a huge amount of data from uh, uh, for AFP surveillance. Um, from countries and uh, this uh, uh, was developed uh, um, uh, by our uh, statistician colleagues at the uh, WHO at the Polio Department, and uh, um, it was a, this was an amazing uh, work and effort to really monitor and uh, uh, try to look deeper into into data. So uh, here, for instance, uh, we selected Nigeria. These are um, our AFP data for Nigeria for 2019, and you can see uh, at the uh, at the left hand side how we have uh, um, on the top the uh, absolute numbers on the uh, lower part we have the percentage and uh, on the right hand side uh, again on the on the top we have absolute numbers whether on the uh, lower part we have uh, uh, the sex disaggregation of the <clears throat> doses that the children received so um this really uh, tells us a lot about uh, what is going on and it's easier for us to see whether is there is something going on and if there is any any particularly issue that we need to investigate further um here again uh we uh, i would like to um talk to you about the importance of uh, indicators. Again, we, we will have a um, little bit more time to talk about indicators, but uh, gender indicators are really important when we try to understand uh, better uh, what is going on and why maybe uh, girls or boys are not reached by uh, immunization campaigns. And uh, um, this uh, it's a compendium of indicators that have been developed by the Equity Reference Group for Immunization, which is a think tank, uh, think tank that uh, was convened by UNICEF and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. WHO is also part of this think tank. And uh, they developed and they worked uh, on indicators that could tell us and that could measure and help us understand uh, uh, how also gender interacts with other dimensions. So, 
um, I think what's in interesting to note here is that, for instance, we don't have just gender immunization related indicators, but for instance, we have what we call also proxy indicators, like for instance, percentage of women employed by occupation or um, proportion of individual individuals who own a mobile. So those are proxy indicators, of course, that are taken from uh, not the health sectors, but that maybe can help us to, um, to, to, to tell us uh, what is going on, to give us a picture of, uh, of, of the context of the country, of, of the region. Uh, so here now, so we can have a little pause and uh, I would like to show you this video, which I think it's really well done and explain a bit better the um, gender-related barriers to immunization. So let me, there it is. I cannot hear the sound. Um, I don't know if other participants can hear that. Oh, I can hear, but uh, uh, it is only you that you cannot hear. Uh, I can't hear either. Oh, why we could before? Let me maybe take out the. <laughs> Michaela, why don't you play it from here? I think then you will hear the sound if you play it like this rather than the presentation. Uh, sorry, from here where? Where you are now, if you play it like that rather than the presentation mode, because I did hear some sound. Can you hear now? No. Oh. Now? No. Okay, too bad. I think we can go on and then um, try again later. I can try before my, my presentation, see if it works from my end. Okay, you want to try now or later? No, go ahead. I can try yeah. later. We'll see. Okay. Okay. Um, let's let's uh, uh, just continue and uh, uh, have a look quick. I think this is also very important. Uh, Shirin um, raised uh, uh, this important issue. Gender does not only mean uh, women's issues. Um, there are uh, gender-related barriers that affect also men and boys. Let's look, for instance, at uh, this data from 2019, uh, sex disaggregated data of non-neonatal tetanus uh, that were reported worldwide, where 35% were female and 65% uh, uh, were male. Uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, uh, um, WHO focused on the elimination of maternal and neonatal tetanus about 2015 um, led to vaccination strategies targeting women of reproductive age, but it seems that less attention has, be, has been given to the immunization of males after infancy. And also the fact that the uh, data on child and adult vaccination uh, coverage and uh, tetanus incidence and mortality uh, were limited. And this is a study uh, published uh, in, the, in, the, in the WHO bulletin, I think it was 2016, uh, saying that um, emerging reports of cases of tetanus following voluntary medical circumcision in different sub-Saharan Africa countries drew attention to the possibility of a gender disparity in tetanus morbidity that disproportionately affected men. So I think it's really important to keep this in mind. Uh, here we are. So I think there are questions. Um, let me maybe uh, stop sharing my screen for a while or go back to, to, the, to the questions. Um, okay, uh, I'll start from... Uh, Niklas, uh, measure gender barriers to access to tetanus vaccine is important but challenging. Could you please elaborate on positions for measuring 
gender bias regularly and when possible as part of routine administrative reporting to allow monitoring of impact program interventions to the current gender barriers. Um, so, uh, so this is a, yes. uh, this is a really important question. Um, one is, uh, <clears throat> thank you. So we, we started the, the, the question, so we would like to maybe invite Nicholas. So for now, for the question on the Q&A, we really encourage you to go and have a look on that and vote for the question that you think, uh, you know, you, you may want to list, have the answer from the panelists. So uh, we have the first one until now is only five votes and it's from Niklas Denilson. So if uh, Michaela, you want to take the Denilson question, what we can do is to have Denilson talking to us to say it loudly uh, in the question. So let me see if Niklas is still connected and we will give the floor, we will allow Niklas to talk. Um, let, let us see. Just to quickly answer, yeah. Alan, that Nicholas, we will answer a little bit your questions in the next section when we're talking about gender analysis. Yeah. Right, so it's over to you then, uh, Michaela, for the presentation. And I, and I think that we can share sharing screen for the video uh, while... Yeah, okay. I think it's, uh, it's over to Shirin in any case, so yeah. So, Shreem? Yes, I'm trying Perfect. to view my screen. Now we can see your screen. Let me try to see if I can show the video with the sound. Um, can you hear Gender this? Roles, can you hear norms, it? Yes, you can. I can. If you can just have the, the widescreen mode, that would be perfect. Thank you. It refers to the socially constructed roles, norms, behaviors, and opportunities that the society considers appropriate for women, girls, boys and men, and people with diverse gender identities. Gender varies from society to society and can be changed. Gender interacts with, but is different from biological sex. Gender also doesn't only mean women or women's issues. Just like age, ethnicity, or economic status, gender affects our access to services, resources, and what challenges and opportunities we might have, including our access to vaccination. In polio eradication, we see gender impacts in different ways. Girls and boys do not always benefit equally from vaccinations. In some societies, boys are valued more than girls, they get better access to food and health services, including vaccination. In some places, false rumors about the polio vaccine mean that boys are not vaccinated as families are more worried about their well-being and only give vaccines to girls. We try to understand and address local norms and roles related to gender so we can ensure we reach all boys and girls with life-saving vaccines. In some places, it is not easy for women to access healthcare with children because they lack resources like money, transportation, or time, or because they're not allowed to leave the home. In many countries, literacy rates are lower among women than among men, which also impacts access to health information and services. The power to make decisions, such as whether or not to vaccinate children, is also influenced by gender roles and norms. The Global Polio Eradication Initiative identifies and addresses gender-related barriers to immunization, communication, and disease surveillance to make sure we reach every last child with vaccines. We look at data on children's vaccination status to track any differences between the number of girls and boys being immunized so we can act on any discrepancies. We monitor data to ensure that paralysis in girls and boys is reported with the same timeliness. We work to make sure that women participate equally and meaningfully in all vaccination activities and that everyone working to eradicate polio has a safe and respectful work environment. Increasing women's participation in polio eradication is the right thing to do, the smart thing to do. Female frontline workers help build trust in their communities. They can enter households in more conservative areas where men are not allowed to interact with women alone. Women can educate other women about issues affecting their own health and their children's health, like the benefits of exclusive breastfeeding. 
so the benefits go beyond polio eradication. Making gender equality the heart of our program results in more children, both girls and boys, being vaccinated and brings us closer to achieving a polio-free world. Gender equality benefits everyone, and it is everyone's business. So glad that was working actually. So now we're on to the last section of our presentation, which is around gender analysis, going back to Nicholas's questions about how to do that. So as you remember, we talked about gender mainstreaming as a way to make sure that we integrate gender into our policy and uh, programs. So gender analysis is a starting point for gender mainstreaming. Gender analysis is a methodology to identify how gender norms, roles, relations, and differences in power, access to resources and opportunities, and rights affect women and men, girls and boys, in a given context and setting. It directs us to identify the best strategies to address harmful gender norms, structures, and behaviors to improve the success of our programs. Uh, gender analysis presents a variety of approaches to systematically examining these differences and understanding how they impact the lives and health of our people in the society. Some of the key areas that you usually look at when you're doing a gender analysis are uh, different needs, priorities, and strengths of women and men, gender relations, beliefs, perceptions, and norms, gender division of labor and pattern of decision making, access to and control over resources, assets or benefits, and barriers and constraints in women and men's participations in decision making and programs. So put it plainly, gender analysis is really a diagnostic tool and a key instrument for gender mainstreaming to identify where are the challenges, where are the gaps, and how can we develop strategies to overcome them and improve uh, our uh, programmatic outcome. Gender strategy, uh, gender analysis is ideally done at the beginning or before any program in order to ensure that the gender dimensions are uh, accounted for and integrated into design and implementation, but it can actually happen or occur any stages during a program and it's uh, finding use to improve results. Uh, for conducting a gender analysis, you need to determine what you need to do, what, what you want to find out and what's the purpose of your gender analysis. Once you have that, you can try to search and review existing gender analysis and assessments uh, related to your uh, health problem, the specific health issue that you're looking at. You can look at gender analysis done by donors or other NGO partners, academics, or even other UN agencies. Once you know the gaps, you can collect primary data or use secondary disaggregated data collected by others. And we can talk a little bit around data in a minute. And once you have your data, you just need to analyze that. You need to analyze the information to identify where are the gender differences and gender-based disparities or constraints and opportunities. Then you need to make sense of your data, understand what are the implications of what you have found, what are the barriers you have identified and how do they uh, affect achieving the health objectives of women and men in, that are targeted by your program. And finally, it's important to use your analysis to design or improve your programs for better results. There is no point of doing a gender analysis if we're not gonna use the finding to make changes. It's important to note that you don't necessarily have to do the gender analysis yourself. There are lots of organizations with a lot of expertise in that and also experts who can help you, that you can contract to help you conducting a gender analysis for you. So what kind of a data do we usually collect for gender analysis? Uh, quantitative data disaggregated by sex and other markers are often useful because when analyzed, they can reveal differences in women's and men's health and lives uh, that are a result of gender roles and expectations and identify areas for further investigation. 
Uh, quantitative data uh, can also be used by using secondary data, as mentioned, such as official national statistics uh, or data collected by donor or other NGOs or academics or by other interagency or UN organizations. However, quantitative data has its limitation and is not always sufficient. We really sometimes need to also apply qualitative methodology, such as in-depth interviews and focus group discussions to capture gender dimensions related to norms, knowledge, attitude, behaviors, and relations in a giving society or a context. And again, coming back to intersectionality, that using data broken by sex alone can leave out important information about differences within groups of women and men. For example, gender power dynamics or differences within, say, older people or adolescents or live, people living in poverty, ethnic minorities, and so on and so forth. So once again, important to bear in mind the intersectional inequalities when collecting and analyzing data. We can also use gender sensitive indicators that Michaela actually referred to. Gender sensitive indicators work to measure change for women and men, girls and boys, as well as measure changes in gender equality that are available. These are many gender sensitive indicators available. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, for example, has an official framework highlighting indicators for all 17 SDGs. And within these, there are 54 core gender sensitive indicators and there are also 34 gender relevant indicators that can be used. Um, there are several gender analysis frameworks that can be used for a gender analysis and each are designed to be used in a particular context or a specific purpose. Uh, a gender analysis framework is helpful because it provides a way to systematize information about the gender differences uh, that you find across different domains and also to help examine how these differences affect the health and lives of women and men. Gender analysis framework often includes tools uh, that provide you with a way of representing the information that the you data you collect in a simple manner and help the decision making. And when deciding which framework to use for any particular situation, it's important to consider what aspects are important for your specific work and the purpose that you have in mind and what you're planning to achieve. The examples I have in this slide, for example, it is a gender analysis framework suggested by UNICEF in a practical guide to integrate gender lens into immunization programs. It is adopted from JPGO's uh, gender analysis toolkit for health system, and it looks at five different domains, roles and responsibilities, access to resources, beliefs, perceptions, needs and priorities, institutions, laws and policies. It's also accompanied with a worksheet that helps you kind of um, capture the data relevant to these different domains in a systematic way. Another gender analysis framework that is often used in health is WHO's gender analysis matrix. This matrix is the tool for analyzing a health problem or issue. And uh, the difference with this framework is that it also helps uncover the impact of not only the social asset, but also the biological sex. So it looks at both biological sex and gender on men's and women's health situation, their access to and control over resources and health outcomes. And you can see the rows on the left side provide a framework for doing an in-depth analysis of the different health-related consideration, risk factors and vulnerability, access and use of health services, health-seeking behavior, treatment options, experiences in healthcare settings, health and social consequences, and the columns on the top uh, provides the gender-related considerations like biological factors, sociocultural factors, and access to and control over resources. So you can do a matrix understanding what are the biological risk factors and vulnerabilities, what are the social cultural and vulnerabilities, what are the vulnerabilities that are kind of a result of access to and control over our resources, and so on and so forth. 
And this is an example of how this could be filled. I'm giving you this only from an HIV example, but we'll hand over now to Michaela that will provide more examples from immunization. Uh, Michaela, over to you. Thank you, Shireen. So um, let's, uh, uh, let's look for an example of how uh, a gender uh, questions, let's say, uh, of a gender, no, sorry, I'm just putting a uh, full screen here. Yeah, I uh, hope you can see. So uh, an example of how questions for a gender analysis of an immunization program in Pakistan could look like. So uh, for instance, uh, we, we should ask ourselves, how do women and men get information about essential uh, vaccine? Uh, what are the preferred channels uh, the, and the trusted sources? Uh, who makes decisions about children's immunization in the household? We, we saw this is a really an important aspect. So uh, what resources do women and men need to be able to ensure that the child is immunized? So money, tra uh, time, transportation, and who have access and control the resources? Uh, in some specific area, who can access households to immunize children where, uh, where house to house campaigns take place? Uh, maybe only women can access in some places. Um, and uh, is there an impact for frontline workers? Uh, another question uh, could be what barriers exist for women and men to access health centers to seek immunizations uh, and how could these barriers uh, be addressed most effectively. And have women and men from different backgrounds been consulted and involved in designing, monitoring and evaluating immunization services. This is a this is really important aspect of planning and, uh, and, uh, and also monitoring uh, uh, your immunization activities. This is taken from, uh, again, the, the toolkit uh, that we will uh, share with you later. So we would like to, uh, to present to you a case. Let's try to uh, put a bit more in practice those, those tools. Of course, I mean, we, we, we need to a bit of exercise. We cannot do it. Uh, we are aware, I mean, we still have um, uh, half an hour left, but Let's uh, uh, try to look at it. So uh, imagine that we are in a country where uh, we received polio surveillance data for acute flaccid paralysis for the semester July, December 2019. And we see uh, from uh, the data that uh, uh, a total of uh, 2,800 and something boys received three plus doses of polio oral vaccination compared to uh, 2,068 girls. So if we look at the, the data, we, we think that there might be a discrepancy between the number of boys and girls uh, uh, that are investigated and that they receive the polio vaccination. So you can see, I put for you the, the, the total data of the AFP investigation uh, numbers. So you see we have nearly 3,000 boys and, uh, and just 2,100 uh, girls. And before we start to think about what could happen here, let's uh, also mm, get some more information about the country. So this country, we know uh, that the high risk groups uh, live mainly in rural area, uh, in isolated and deprived communities, that the vaccinators are mainly men, uh, that in those communities, the level of health lit literacy, it's, uh, it's quite low and religious leaders uh, uh, sometimes contributed to spread misinformation. The country ranked very low in a in a in a in a gender in a global gender gap index. So there is a really uh, an important gender gap in this in this country. And uh, we also know that the participation of women in the labor force it's low, and the literacy rates as well it's quite low for women. And they have a limited access to land and resources. So, with that in mind, what could be uh, some of the gender related uh, um, Buyers that we that, that we see here, or that, that can be behind the, uh, this discrepancy, and to do so, I would like to uh, re-present um, you uh, the the framework that Shirin uh, um, uh, presented, uh, and uh, and to try and to see really how this framework uh, uh, try to to. Um, uh, let's say helps you to understand better uh, what is going on. And so here um, we try to uh, fill this, uh, this um, 
these metrics having the case in mind and of course i mean you don't you don't have to uh, fill every single box maybe uh, some box uh, uh, do not uh, apply to, to the particular case and also let's uh, uh, let's remember how uh, as you as you know very well uh, but how there are different uh, let's say um, individuals that are involved uh, in, a, in, a, in a child immunization so uh, for instance if we look at the biological uh, influence uh, if we ask ourselves uh, um, how the, the, the biology um, um, affects uh, the risk factor and vulnerability. Well, in this particular case, we know that boys seems to be um, um, a higher risk of developing paraly paralytic polio and the male infant and children seems to have a, a weaker immune system. So maybe uh, that is also why we have uh, more boys uh, investigated with AFP. Um, what are what could be the social cultural factors that uh, that uh, that are behind uh, this discrepancy? Um, well, we know that boys maybe are in some contexts are often allowed to play outside. There is a boy to boy contact rate higher in some countries. Whether we know that girls uh, uh, maybe they are kept at home and they are uh, can be under uh, under immunized. Um, if we look at the access and control over resources, uh, uh, we know that both boys and girls in hard to reach community are maybe more vulnerable because it's, uh, it's uh, more difficult to reach them. And uh, as, as I said, the girls are kept at home. So with the housework um, and also the maternal perception of distance is an important factor that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, influence uh, whether the mother is able to um, to reach the, the health center or not. So um, we really want to here to give you um, a, a, a practical example. I, I know we are running out of time, so I will not go uh, through it, but of course we can go back if you feel like you would like to, um, if you have more questions on this particularly this particular metrics, uh, let's uh, look at just another toolkit. So this is a, uh, we wanted to give you some tools. So uh, this is an example of a, of an annex of a, 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 a checklist for a gender checklist for responding to a polio uh, outbreak uh, or event, and really you see how. You have to have this in mind and uh, this checklist in mind to be sure that uh, uh, there is a meaningful particip participation of, uh, of men and women in the, in the planning of operations, in the stakeholder participation, in the data collection and analysis, and in capacity uh, building. Uh, so here, uh, yeah, we would like to uh, conclude with the this uh, quote saying that taking action to improve gender equity in health is one of the most direct and potent ways to reduce health inequities and ensure effective use of health uh, resources. Uh, here uh, you find some tools. Uh, don't worry because we will share those tools with you. So you don't have to uh, write it down everything. And uh, with that, we thank you for your attention. And uh, I will stop. Uh, sharing my screen or maybe I will keep it uh, if you want to go back to any of the slide want some more clarification on something and uh, and so we can uh, answer to your question now thank you very much Michaela and Shivin that was really captivating and I know that you know uh, the attendees they have many many questions on the chat box you were having valuable comment lots of them that i don't even know if we can read all of them but what we, will, we are going to do now is to turn to the q a box because even there we have many interaction happening so i would like you to get ready with sharing to give answers to the uh, those who ask their question and i know that the first one with two questions is nicholas denilson and i'm i'm really uh, i would really pleased to have it talking to you directly. So let me see if I, I can ask uh, Nicholas Danielson to unmute himself and uh, he will loudly ask you his question, I mean, his questions because he has two and you know uh, the most one of them is eight votes and one seven votes. So Nicholas 
um, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are connecting from. You have been unmuted. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going to read out my, my questions, uh, uh, I think. Um, so the first one is about measuring the in measuring gender barriers routinely in immunization service provision. This is um, important, but it's also challenging because it's difficult to find indicators that you can measure routinely. So uh, my question was if the um, panel could elaborate on options for measuring gender barriers regularly and when possible as part of routine administrative reporting to allow monitoring of impact of program interventions that are aimed at overcoming gender barriers that um, mitigate the impact of gender barriers. Uh, I mean, we we are measuring gender barriers in in surveys, in in house large household surveys and uh, CAP studies and so on. Uh, but these are of course of um, longer intervals between them, and and uh, it's it's difficult to use that information for monitoring of. Um, um, uh, of, of program performance when it comes to um, interventions and strategies to reduce the impact of gender barriers. Over. Yeah, I can uh, try to answer yeah. your question. Thank you very much. Um, so, I think the the first uh, the first step is that's also Shirin pointed out. It's it's the gender analysis because. Um, we need to, I mean, we cannot solve invisible problems, right? So we have to understand uh, where the problem is. And uh, uh, so we, um, after, after we have uh, hopefully understood what is the problem, then we have, uh, uh, then we can uh, try to uh, elaborate a strategy to overcome that problem. And at that point, we can, we can see with our indicators if we are, uh, if we are, uh, doing good in in trying to tackle that problem. I would say um, the very first thing it's a, a sex disaggregated data. I know this is uh, I mean kind of an obvious thing, but uh, also from our work uh, uh, we, we realize it is not not always uh, sex disaggregated data uh, uh, is available. And if you don't know if there is a discrepancy, you don't know what it's going on. And uh, uh, maybe the data uh, tell you that everything is fine, but then maybe when you uh, further disaggregate by age, this is also something that we saw with our dashboard. So when you further disaggregate by age, by region, there is when you start seeing things going on in some region for some, uh, 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 from some uh, age. So um, for the routine, uh, it's uh, I know it's quite challenging. Um, it, it depends also on on, on the uh, vaccination campaign it's taking place. I know that uh, uh, health workers are overwhelmed by the by the, by the um, I mean the, the amount of data that they have to fill, and so sometimes it's not possible to uh, to tick a box to say whether it was a female or a male. Uh, but then maybe it's something that can be done in the monitoring uh, um, in the monitoring activities. So to 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 check whether uh, more boys or more uh, girls have been uh, vaccinated. Um, so I hope it uh, answered to your questions. But feel, feel free to <laughs> to let me know. And just to add to to Mikael. As I, I do understand the challenges of doing the routine monitoring in a way that um, you can really collect those data. But doing a gender analysis, you know, at least at some point will uh, give you an idea about what are the challenges and where are the kind of specific obstacles and what kind of a routine data you need to monitor over time to see whether your uh, targeted interventions has helped overcome those barriers. So I think even if I understand that, you know, you can't collect everything uh, routinely all the time, doing a gender analysis can guide you like what would be the selected indicators that you might pay more attention to in your program. I hope that's helpful. Class. Yeah, thank you very much. That that's helpful, and and I see that there are some uh, people who would like to provide answers live as well. Maybe I can just take my second question as well because it's related to the first one. Um, and 
so that question is about um, mitigating measures, strategies to reduce uh, gender barriers to vaccination. Um, and I, of course, I understand that what kind of strategies you adopt has a lot to do with the gender analysis to start with. Huh? But I, I wondered if you could say something about strategies that are sort of um, generally considered effective um, th that could be up applied um, with some variation uh, uh, across the globe. Um, I don't know what they would be. For example, engagement of fathers of men, um, um, adjusting opening hours or communicating um, differently to, to mothers and fathers and things like that. That's my question, over. Hi, Shirin, I can take that. And if you want, you can, you can add, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, yeah, what you're saying, it's, uh, it's really, um, it's really the case. A again, of course, it depends on, on what the problem is, right? So um, once you uh, understood why there is a, a low coverage, um, you can try to adjust uh, your strategy. So again, depending on the problem, uh, if, um, for instance, uh, there, there is a problem of reaching the, the, the vaccination health center point, um, you can adjust. I mean, if you are mainly women uh, who are the caregiver and bring the children to the vaccination, if they have to work, they don't have time. So you, you have to adjust it. You have to maybe open it during the, during the, the weekend. You can do it uh, during the evening. Uh, as you said, uh, involving men as uh, it's it's really important because uh, we saw how uh, m many times they're the decision uh, maker in their own uh, the, the decision making power. So they are the one uh, taking the decision, if it, even if it's the mother. So uh, also targeting them uh, with many, uh, I mean, with many different activity in in the community. Uh, we also see how uh, effective it could be to involve religious leaders. Uh, in many countries, we saw that um, religious leaders pl uh, played an important role in uh, uh, in involving the community to take part to uh, to vaccination. Uh, um, campaign and to vaccinate their, their children. So those are some examples, but uh, uh, yeah, of course, as I said, it, it also depend, depends on, on the particular problem you want to solve. Thank you. Uh, on that note as well, uh, we didn't have enough time to go through different kind of programs can be done, but I think one note that is important that to the extent possible, it's best to not try strategies that can reinforce existing harmful gender norm that uh, say that if the decision is only like you know it lays with the father is not to reinforce a program that where women are excluded and fathers this is permission are taken just because that will give you a better outcome but it's really important to also challenge some of these unequal gender norms and also kind of promote more joint and shared decision making i think there are studies that show that in in cases where both fathers and mothers are engaged in the decision making the immunization coverage are actually better as well. So I think it's also important that uh, there are different ways of doing programs, but trying to be transformative or responsive in a way that can also eventually promote uh, and promote gender equality and transform gender norms to positive, uh, positive gender norms, that will be also very much encourageable. One thing that I want to kind of address that uh, perhaps I didn't emphasize much during the presentation, but comes up very frequently, I think the issue is participation. When doing a gender analysis, in particular in a community in a setting, the best way to actually promote and drive a change is to really engage that community in doing the gender analysis with you, to have those conversations for the community to themselves identify what are the gender norms that actually creates those barriers to immunization in their society, in their community. And often they will come up with very good suggestions and very good solutions that can be applied and people will be also more receptive to them because that's their solution and it's more culturally sensitive and acceptable as well. So the participation is a really key and fundamental issue in both gender analysis and gender mainstreaming for improving results and success. Thank you so much, uh, Michaela and Mana. I, I, I think that uh, Niklas is 
it's okay with questions. So we, we, we do have many questions on the Q&A. We have, you know, few time left. So uh, we have one uh, from Abdi Mohammed, and I know that uh, Firin and Michaela, you really, with your explanation, you really responded to many, many of the questions on the Q&A, but we really want to hear from uh, Abdi. Abdi, because you raised your hand and you had a question that collected eight votes, can you hear us? Do you have something to add or? Please feel free to unmute yourself. The floor is yours, Abdi. Go ahead and just click on your mic. So, um, so while Abdi is probably not able to uh, unmute his mic, so if um, Abdi, we we can hear you now. Some voices from from you. So while they are, um, so um, Michaela and Shivin, please feel free to have a look on the q and and see if there is a question that you have not addressed yet, because I think that you went really deeply into, uh, with your explanation. We have Emmanuel Doku um, with one of the questions with five votes. I don't know if Emmanuel can talk to us. If you are here, Emmanuel, we would like to hear from you as Abdi is still having some uh, technical issues. So Emmanuel, good afternoon or good evening. Can you hear us? So absolutely. Um, so I think that participants, so we also encourage, if you have a question that, yes, Hello. Emmanuel. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, Emmanuel, please proceed. So you have a okay. question on the Q&A box. All right, all right. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So my question actually is rooted from an observation that has been made, uh, especially in uh, most West African and East African countries where when it comes to immunization activities for the child to be able to assess the services, especially at the health facility level, it is the mother's responsibility or it is, it is seen as the mother's responsibility to take the child to the facility. So, um, my question is related to the fact that uh, as, a, as a world body, what are some of the pragmatic steps that are being taken to make sure that men also get actively involved? That it is not only seen as the woman's or the mother's responsibility, sole responsibility to do this particular tax, but also the man also gets to know that I need to take my child to the facility to assess immunization services or even human outreaches, I need to make my child available for immunization services that is uh, my question thank you very much so thank you emmanuel so we have uh, michaela or shirin who want to come first i can take that and shirin can add um thank you this is uh emmanuel thank you emmanuel this is really an important issue um again uh, it depends on the context and and on the settings on the cultural uh, norms and regions, but uh, there are many ways. I mean, uh, the, the, the most, uh, let's say, uh, the first that I think of uh, uh, to engage men, it's um, uh, the fact that uh, um, messaging about immunization, promotion of, uh, of uh, immunization uh, must not only target women, not taking just for granted that if it breached the, the woman, the mother, you're okay. Uh, I mean, this is not enough because uh, if you if you want to involve both, you you should expect to to be both in uh, in in these activities. So if you organize, I don't know, for instance, a, an outreach, a community uh, um, a discussion or focus group, asking or pretending that both the parents are there. Um, you can train, uh, uh, for instance, the health, uh, the, the health staff in the in the in the health centers or in the clinic. It depends where where you are. To also involve the the father uh, uh, and ask the mother to involve the father and and ask for the father to be present and targeting really the message to both because I, this is really important and you can also engage a men's uh, association or 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 men's groups to to uh, to help in in this so of course, as I said, it depends a lot on, 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 on the country, on the setting, on, on the region, on the community. Uh, but uh, 
there are many things that you can do uh, to involve men and, and I'm sure that uh, having those I mean, having those examples that I gave you in mind, you can think of something probably more tailored to to uh, to your to your country. Over. I hope this answers. I don't know if Shirin wants to. Ab I, I absolutely agree with with Michaela, and I echo that. And just build on what she already said as well is that we often try to address the problem laying in the community, but we also have to recognize that a lot of those biases and unconscious perceptions we as health providers, research, we also have those. So it's important to make sure that we are trying to also at the same time be mindful about the gender biases the gender norms that the the health system health providers are also reinforcing and not again in the messaging in the the, the way that we are using images uh, in the way that we are uh, interacting with fathers when they come to the health facilities all of those the way we are structuring or providing services all of those should be with gender in mind for us as providers to also keep that in mind it's not all always a community that they have to change their gender norms, we are part of that community as well. And I think that's a really important message to take. Thank you so much. So uh, Emmanuel, I think that you, you have your answer here. Uh, thank you so much for participating. We have only five more minutes left. And I know that we have so many questions and comments that would be interesting to read so that you know, we, we can have the reflection. The, the topic is really important for us, specifically when we are trying to planning for routine immunization. This is a topic that we really want to look into. So we want to hear from Dr. Bujan, the last, the last uh, person to participate, and then we'll look into how to make available the Q&A to you, uh, Michaela and Shirin, if you can kindly provide answers so that we'll be share that in the Dropbox folder later on. Dr. Gujan, if you can hear me, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Am I audible? Loud and clear. Please proceed. Yeah. Thank you so much. And this has been really wonderful. Uh, it, it's been one of the very important and good webinars that I've had a chance to participate. Uh, it's not, it's more of a comment for the panelists rather than a question. So we all know that ultimately everything boils down to your coverage rates. And because in a majority of regions, the coverage rates between boys and girls are not very dissimilar. I think the, the, for the governments, it might become a bit difficult to allocate and, and uh, identify and allocate resources which help to identify the gender gaps in the immunization program. And as we have been discussing, a lot of these gaps are implicit. So I think the onus basically rests on the technical partners, donors, uh, the NGOs and academicians to sort of re make, to highlight this issue to the governments and do uh, important work wherein this particular factor, which definitely has a bearing on immunization service delivery uh, is brought to the forefront. Because as we move from coverage rates of 60, 70, 80, and, and uh, try to move towards better immunization coverage rates. I think until and unless gender equity is addressed, we cannot uh, achieve the uh, achieve that that particular goal. Uh, so in any and for instance, at the Gates Foundation now there is a conscious effort to ensure that all investments are gender intentional or uh, or or gender transformative. So if there is time, would, would love to hear that as a community, how can we actually take up this very important uh, aspect and then bring it to the forefront so that the governments do realize uh, the part which they have been possibly missing out in their programs. Over. Absolutely wonderful, Dr. Bujan. So thank you very much for participating, for contributing. I know that the discussion, we, we, we you know, we, the time is really short, like uh, Sherin was saying from the beginning, it's an important topic. We, we can discuss for hours and hours, but your time is important for us. We really want to make sure that we respect your timing. You are busy professional. So we'll find a way to respond to all the questions, even the comment. 
to uh, send them to Shvirin and Michaela to provide you answers, specifically for those of you who are taking the brisk calls. We now understand that the way we were intended to use the nine transformative investment of the WHO brisk document can change the, the more we get into the new topic. You know, this topic that is really important, and we want you want to be part of the game. So I would really like to encourage you to join us on the 30th of uh, September for the next one. We'll be talking about the COVID-19 and the routine immunization planning. I know that is very important. If you get, if you have a look on the chat, you will see that you can register for, for, for that webinar and it will be another exciting one. So um, I'm sorry that we have to stop now. Um, I will just uh, thank all of you to be here. If you are a scholar in the Greece course, done the right thing. So let us continue the discussion. They are available uh, from WHO Sajamata aspect. They can respond to your question. We can continue using our own platform to, you know, to really uh, capture the topic. It's a new one, but interesting one. I will stop here. Thanks all of you. If you are not in the scholar course, we encourage you to come back for another discussion, sharing your experience with us. So I will turn myself to Shireen and Michaela for the closing remark and uh, thank them for the brilliant presentation. We learned, I learned a lot. I was so quiet because I was just, you know, trying to digest the content, the rich content. Thank you so much. Over to you, Michaela, then Shirin for the closing remark. Thanks all of you. Shirin, I will uh, do my very short remarks and we'll end over to you. I will, uh, we will answer um, better to, the, to this last question, but it's also part of my final remarks. And part of the answer to this question, uh, data and evidence uh, help us to, um, uh, to, 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 to put forward and, uh, and show that there is a problem. If we do not have data, we, as I said, we, we cannot solve invisible problems. We need the data to measure and to show that the, the, the problem and the evidence, uh, it's uh, our best ally to, to solve problems. So uh, thank you all uh, for taking the time to take part to this uh, special session. And, uh, and um, I will uh, end over to Shirin. Thank you so much. And thank you for the organizers for uh, allowing us to kind of be with you today. Thank you for all the very thoughtful and very um, smart questions. I think we don't have the answers to all these questions, but I think just the fact that uh, we are having this conversation in this course is just a testimony that these issues are getting more attention. At the global level, I know that there are a number of gender strategies related to immunization that are being developed. And I think our collective awareness about these issues hopefully will uh, lead to a, a kind of a more systematic way of us doing things and taking gender into account. I hope this presentation was a teaser, as I said, for you to get more involved in these issues, to consider how you can, in your setting, in your program, try uh, to tweak things differently, to try to address some of these barriers. Miguel and I are available throughout the course to answer any questions you might have and share any uh, knowledge or experience we have, but also learn from you. Uh, again, what are the different gender barriers that we might not be aware of that it's also useful for us to kind of um, reflect upon and see how we can bring it back into the global discussions in policy, gender policies, for example. And with that, thank you so much. Good luck, everybody, with the important work that you have. And again, thank you so much, Alain and Jill Mill and Ja for organizing this course and allowing us to present this uh, this work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Yes, thank you, WHO, for making us the pioneer of this discussion. Bye for now and stay safe.